and welcome to What Goes Up, a weekly markets podcast. My name is Mike Regan. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg. And I'm Aldana Hayek, a cross-asset reporter with Bloomberg. And this week on the show, well, the Federal Reserve did not raise interest rates at their meeting this week, but nonetheless, the markets freaked out a little bit. Probably because policymakers released projections showing that they don't expect to cut rates as aggressively as previously expected next year. Stocks sold off, and so did the bond market, especially on the long end of the curve, with the 10-year Treasury yield reaching the highest level since 2007, and the 30-year yield uh, reaching the highest since 2011. While the latest update from the Fed makes it look more and more like they're expecting a soft landing for the economy, well, the markets are taking it pretty hard. We'll get into it with the chief U.S. economist at a major Wall Street bank. But Vildana, first... I have to say, it's been a while since we bugged our listeners to go and rate and review the show on Apple Podcast. I think we need a new gimmick to entice them. Do you have one in mind? Funny you should ask, I do. What is it? Well, I'm thinking since you're a Buffalo Bills fan, Mm -hmm. you could do like the Bills fans do at the tailgates and like smash a a card table. Yeah, you have to jump. You you have to jump through the table. Jump through the table. Yeah. Well, how about, would you think you could, say we get 100 more reviews, you could, uh, how about ratings. this? 100 more reviews and they make it to the Super Bowl. Oh, both of those? Yeah. Both of those items no, have to be? Too much. Then, too then you'll, you'll jump on a car table. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But the 100 <laughs> reviews being the first, uh, first order of business. Fine. <laughs> and, uh, it'll be a weird expense account item, uh, smash card table. But <laughs> okay. I, I think you think I think can think expense it to Bloomberg? I was just—I yeah, would—I would, sure. would do it just for fun. I, I don't know if our guest is a football fan at all, but we have Ellen Zentner, chief U.S. economist at Morgan Stanley, on this week. And Ellen, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, guys. I love it. Thanks for asking me. Are you a Buffalo Bills fan? A secret Buffalo Bills fan, by any chance? No, not even secret. I uh, was quite into college ball growing up in Texas. That was really the Texas thing, high school and college ball. And uh, never been a big fan of uh, the NFL, although my dad was a a big uh, Saints fan, New Orleans fan. Well, if I remember correctly, you went to Colorado. You have Coach Prime now to uh, to root for. I did go to Colorado, but, you know, I'm a walking paradigm. I started at University of Texas and never stopped being a Longhorns fan. Like I am loyal to the Bills. But, Ellen, we had this big week, which is why I'm so thankful you were able to join us this week. Because, as Mike mentioned, Markets sort of had a little freak out post the Fed meeting. So just to start, can you give us your big takeaways from the Fed meeting? Yeah, look, I think it's undeniable that the statement um, was more hawkish than we expected. I think for me, you know, in the current conditions paragraph, which is how the, the Fed describes sort of what's going on or what's happened since our last meeting, they, you know, it is a fact that jobs have slowed but remain strong, and they noted that. It is also a fact that inflation has come down quite a bit but remains robust, and they did not note that. And sometimes what they leave out can be just as important as what they put in. I mean, Chair Powell did note it in the press conference um, several times that core inflation has come down significantly. Well, why didn't they just note that fact in the statement? It's because you're far from declaring victory. God forbid that the market thinks that you're declaring victory over inflation uh, and you get some easing in financial conditions you hadn't planned on when tight financial conditions is really what they need to sustain to be sure that the economy is going to continue to slow. It's been growing much too quickly this year. For a minute, I'd I'd like to sort of just step back and talk about, say, the last three or four years. Um, You know, I feel like for the uh, art or science of uh, economics, however you you view it, it's been a really weird few years. You know, we've had this massive shutdown of the economy, like nothing we've ever seen. Then this massive stimulus to bring it back to life followed on by, you know, a a major war in Europe. What's it been like to be a really high level, very closely watched economist during all this? Uh, You know, are there lessons to be learned? Because I feel like it was so hard to predict and forecast anything 
throughout all of this? What, what's it been like during this whole last few years? Gosh, well, it's it's been exciting, uh, to say the <laughs> least. I think, you know, the word humble comes to mind. Uh, you know, it's been a humbling experience. And uh, it's it's taught me and my team to be very creative in our approach to uh, thinking about the outlook. And frankly, I've been looking forward to, you know, sort of the period that we're going through now and next year where, you know, it's a period of normalization as we get COVID further into the rearview mirror. I, I think, you know, what I'm starting to realize with some of the incoming data is that it seems like we go through these big crises and there's a lot of never will we ever's. And we did this after 2008 as well. Never will we ever take on debt again. Never will we ever buy homes again. And guess what? We do. We do all of those things again. Uh, but you just have to get the crisis further into the rearview mirror. Folks were saying, we'll never go see a movie again. We're never going to the theater ever again. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty sure that Barb and Hybern brought in a billion dollars through the box office. So I'm looking forward to more of the data as it unfolds to just see a normalization of the economy. I don't think a whole lot has changed in the way we go about our business. I think we just have to get a lot of these big distortions uh, that are now unwinding out of the way. So you say you've been very creative in your approach what does that entail? Because I remember during the pandemic, a lot of people were looking at these sort of alternative data, looking at office occupancy rates, as you mentioned, movie theater going, uh, you know, foot different foot traffic, all kinds of different measures had come about during the pandemic. They've sort of fallen off to the wayside more recently. But so what, are, what types of things does your team look at now? Yeah, well, I think to me, what was really lucky is that even before the pandemic hit, uh, you know, technology was advancing in a way that we were getting more and more private data sources and high frequency data for sources, daily uh, data um, that was becoming more prevalent so that we were starting to find new ways to track the economy. The need for that during COVID really escalated. Uh, and so, you know, this is where we were using Google Earth to look at ships that were parked offshore that ha were not able to be unloaded and more robust use of things like Google Maps and Open Table uh, to figure out uh, if people were starting to move and shake again and going out to dine uh, and, and that sort of thing. And that kind of data, those data sets proliferated. And hey, for a time, they were free. <laughs> now those data sets, have become more and more expensive. Um, but uh, using those data sets instead of just, you know, the traditional or in addition to the traditional uh, government and other private sources that were already prevailing before COVID really helped us stay more abreast of exactly what was going on uh, on the ground. And, and I tell you what, the, the fact that all of that's been introduced and used more robustly now uh, means that also we have an even more, uh, an even larger portfolio of data to rely on during government shutdowns when the government data is not available. Uh, we used to fly blind during government shutdowns. And I say this because we're facing a possible government shutdown uh, on September 30th. Uh, and depending on the breadth and the length of that, we might start to miss data points. Uh, and luckily, we've got private sources and other high-frequency data where we can have some sort of idea of what the economy is doing, even if we're not getting the official government data. And so I think, I think even in the field of economics, we've seen a good deal of transformation of technology and how we use it. You read my mind, Alan, because I wanted to ask you about that looming uh, government shutdown, potential government shutdown. Um, and reading one of your recent notes, um, you seem to think that it could be a, a sort of catalyst to uh, for the Fed to pause again in November. But walk us through exactly how you're thinking about it. Is it the lack of available data for the Fed that would cause that? Or is it the potential damage to the economy that could be done from a shutdown, a little of both? What's sort of the implications for us for this one more curveball to be thrown at the economy at this point in the cycle? A, a good economist always says it's a little bit of both. 
<laughs> and um, two-handed economist, right? Two-handed economist, but it, but it really is. So um, in monetary policy making, um, uncertainty tends to lead to policy paralysis. And so certainly when you have a government shutdown uh, and the, the breadth of it matters, right? If it's a partial shutdown, there are some agencies that will continue to operate and we can continue to get things like payroll data, even if we don't get Census Bureau data uh, uh, and the like. If it's a full government shutdown, then you really don't get uh, any of the government uh, data. And so if we're lacking uh, data that the Fed can can officially sink its teeth into, right, then that's going to lead to uh, an inability to make a decision about the path for rates. Uh, and so that's sort of through the, the lens of the Fed becomes foggy. Um, the damage to the economy comes from, say, a full government shutdown where uh, all non-essential workers are furloughed. And our estimate is that for every week of shutdown, it shaves off about 0.2 percentage points from GDP growth. And so that's where you're actually getting to the meat of it, that you have uh, an impact uh, on the outlook. Now, we can go back and look at past government shutdowns and see that, okay, in hindsight, they were sort of a blip in the economic outlook because the government opens back up. You do have some permanent loss of activity, workers that weren't buying lunch around the, the agencies, uh, you know, those um, restaurants, coffee vendors, others are not going to make up for that. But, you know, workers go back to work. Congress has always approved back pay for those furloughed workers. And so especially for, for um, income, um, it, it ends up being a blip. But for the time being, it's something that, that stays the Fed's hand. Now, in this case, right, they've got a lot of time on their hands. They've got until the end of the year to decide if they're going to hike further. And they've left the door open to hike further if needed. I have a strong view that they're done here, but they have left the door open. Uh, and so uh, this is just something that, uh, you know, the, the, the incoming data that we've got over the next several weeks, say, or month tells me that uh, it is highly unlikely they hike in November, but they still have the December meeting to consider after that. What potentially might make them hike in November or December? And if, if they are done here... Can you lay out your views for what you expect in 2024? Because I think you are projecting cuts starting in March. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think for them to hike in November and December, you know, two things have to happen. One, they're pleased with what they've seen with uh, increased slack in the labor market and the slowdown in job gains. They noted that in the statement. Three-month moving average is around 150,000 um, for payrolls now. Let's say that that starts to reaccelerate again. Uh, and so it doesn't look like that slowdown in job gains is durable. And then you pair that with, say, core services. I'm, I'm going to strip out durable goods prices because they've been in deflation and, and that's only 25% of the core inflation bucket. And so it's services that really matter here. And let's say that core services uh, also reaccelerate. And, and for that to happen, uh, you really need core services uh, to pop upward uh, to around 0.6% month over month, which would be quite a deviation from the current trend. Um, but those things together, you could see putting a November hike um, back on the table, putting a hike in December solidly on the table. And so, you know, I've got a strong conviction from the forecast that we have for the incoming uh, data that it's not going to meet that criteria but there's there's always a bar and and we just think that the bar is higher for them to do something uh, further this year um, in 2024 the the cuts that we have there you know you mentioned that we're expecting them to to start in March we have a quarterly pace 25 basis points a quarter you know the the Fed is now expecting two cuts next year and um, it may be a little tongue-in-cheek to say, but the difference between the Fed's expectation and our own is a difference of opinion around the outlook. So we have a forecast that this deceleration and in inflation continues. That means that even as the Fed holds rates steady at between five and a quarter and five and a half percent, if inflation is falling, 
then real rates continue to, to remain very restrictive around that 2% level in our forecast, which is historically quite high. The Fed's forecast has real rates rising further from around 1.9% at the end of this year to 2.5% next year. You plug that into any macro model, and that doesn't look like a Fed that's really wanting to achieve a soft landing. And I think therein lies the, the issues that can come about uh, uh, with internal consistency when you're forecasting by committee. It, it's not quite consistent that, that the median forecast of the Fed suggests that real rates are going to need to rise six tenths further next year, yet they're wanting to achieve a soft landing. There's something off there. Can you talk about real rates a bit more? Why do real rates matter? And can you talk about the sort of through line to the real economy? Yeah, so real rates matter both from a company perspective in terms of profitability, from how restrictive credit is in the economy, uh, banking's ability and willingness to lend. Uh, and, you know, if you think about the, where the Fed thinks the, the neutral rate of interest should be, right? They think the neutral rate of interest is half a percent for the real rate. So 2% real rate is really restrictive really far into restrictive territory. And, you know, feeding that through into macro models would tell you that that's going to have a a pretty big downward impact uh, on the economy. And I think much larger than what the the, what the Fed um, thinks is necessary in order to slow inflation. I don't think individual policymakers are really thinking that we need to have two and a half percent real interest rates next year, that they need to be two percentage points higher than neutral. But that's what it looks like if you were to just take their their um, forecast at, at face value. The impact to the, the real economy um, is essentially what we've been seeing, right? It's not that the Fed's uh, interest rates have not had an impact. Uh, you know, we've we've already gone through a recession in housing. We saw the impact on housing first and foremost. Uh, it's a very interest rate sensitive area of the economy. Uh, we've seen higher interest rates uh, uh, have the effect of slowing demand for credit and credit availability, making credit more expensive. Uh, we are of the camp that monetary policy works with long lags, and that is the biggest disagreement, the outstanding disagreement on the, on the FOMC. Right, those that believe monetary policy works pretty quickly through the economy, and those that believe it works with a lag. So, while it may look like we've escaped unscathed after such a rapid pace of tightening in monetary policy, uh, we think that all of the impacts have not yet been felt, and that uncertainty alone means that there's a good deal of of, of downside risk um, to the economy uh, that we think is out there. Obviously, the other big elephant in the room these days is the price of oil. Uh, West Texas Intermediate is back in the, the $90 a barrel range, mostly a supply issue with Russia and some of the OPEC nations, Saudi Arabia, really limiting production. You and your team had an interesting note out on this about a week ago. And you know, to summarize, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but Basically, it seems like you think um, a, a lot of people are worried about the inflationary aspects of oil rising like this. But uh, you point out it, it, it should take a while for it to feed into the core uh, measures of inflation that exclude energy and food. Uh, but that perhaps the that sort, sort of tax on the consumer element of oil is a bigger story um, here. So how big of a risk is this oil price shock uh, to, to both sides of the equation, growth and inflation. Um, because I th- one thing I would point out I think is different about this than a lot of oil price shocks. A lot of times you get this spike in oil prices because of, say, a hurricane in the Gulf or some geopolitical tension that really ratchets up the, the, the speculation in the market that boosts the price. And all that turns out to be ephemeral and, and short-lived. I, personally, I'm not sure if that's the case this time with the OPEC producers really um, seeming very happy to keep the price higher uh, for for the near future. But I'm wondering how you're thinking about it. How long do we need to see prices elevated for the risk to really become acute, both from an inflationary and uh, economic perspective? 
Yeah, so it's it's great points. Uh, we like to point to weather forecasters and commodity strategists to make us feel better as economists when we're trying to get things right in the economy. It's a really tough job because there are a lot of people that will tell you only geopolitics matters for oil prices. And so I have no idea where oil prices will go, but I will tell you that our commodity strategists do believe, as you noted, that this is this may be more durable. Um, but it is a mixed bag for the U.S. economy. When it is a supply shock uh, and not a demand shock, demand shock would be that just just the strength of the U.S. economy and global economy is so great that demand is outstripping supply. That tends to have a more muted impact on the economy than if it's a supply shock where the amount of barrels that we're producing globally just drops. Uh, and so uh, in that case, you do get an impact uh, on demand on top of the impact on inflation. So we've modeled these changes and a 10% increase in oil prices uh, does raise headline inflation in the U.S. by about uh, 35 basis points on headline over a a three-month period if you just modeled it as a one-off shock. But the transfer to core prices in the U.S., because really you're only immediately impacting transportation prices in in core inflation. It's only about two to three bips, right? Two to three basis points on core inflation. So a really, really small effect. What outweighs that, and I think you you were getting at this, and what we addressed in the note is that it acts as a tax on households. If you are paying more to gas up at the pump, then you are having to pull spending from elsewhere. And so uh, it it tends to reduce consumer buying power and weighs on not just real income growth, but real consumer spending. And that is the predominant concern of the Fed today. So it's really a blessing in disguise. If you're the Fed and you have been trying to slow the economy and the consumer has just been frustratingly resilient, if you can get some additional help from higher gas prices, then you might welcome that. It becomes problematic only if it is sustained over longer periods of time. And then, as Chair Powell noted um, at the uh, uh, Fed meeting, uh, it then becomes something that could pose a risk to inflation expectations, raising inflation expectations. But it does have to be sustained for some time. So Mike said rising oil prices were another elephant in the room. But I can actually name like a bunch more, (laughs) including that consumer loan repayments are restarting. We also had a survey that we had done uh, at Bloomberg where the majority of respondents we had asked about consumer spending said that personal consumption, they see personal consumption going down in the first quarter of 2024. So how do you see all of these factors impacting the consumer? Yeah, so I think the the student loan, uh, the resumption of the student loan debt payments is a great point to note. Um, We have tried to use surveys to get at the percentage of student loan borrowers that say they are going to start paying that back right away because there is an option to be able to delay that into the second quarter, sorry, the first quarter of 2024. Uh, And, and, and I've, I like to think that, you know, as, as, Good debt holding Americans, we will delay that payment as long as we can, but it probably does create a drag in the fourth quarter and the first quarter. Um, I will note that it has been surprising the amount of payments that have been resumed already in anticipation of that. But you can imagine that that folks that have decided to start repayments already are those that want the balance to be lower when the interest rate is again applied. And of course, those that have paid it down already or already restarted that are obviously not the lower income student borrowers. Really, those are going to be the ones that are delaying the payments the most. But we have taken into account not just sort of the payback from, as I mentioned, you know, Barbenheimer hitting in the third quarter, Taylor Swift and Beyonce tours peaking in the third quarter. You're going to have some payback in the fourth quarter from that, plus the start of the student loan repayments. Uh, And so we already have a forecast that consumer spending is in decline in the fourth quarter. Now, some of that are just those one-off impacts fading. 
but I think further weight on consumer spending in the first quarter um, is likely as well. Now, is the consumer falling off a cliff? No. We think that in the grand scheme of things, when you smooth through these impacts, it really shows that consumer spending is just continuing to slow. And there is sort of a, a, a little spoken about um, silver lining here, and that is that in the second quarter, wage growth among lower income households started to turn positive on an inflation adjusted basis because inflation has come down. Now, higher gas prices can throw a monkey wrench in that temporarily. But that means that we have started to get some modicum of buying power back for lower income households. So I think there's there's plenty here that tells me that the consumer should not fall off a cliff, but that consumer spending will be slowing. Um, and I think that will, you know, 70 percent of the economy is consumer spending. And so that's critical um, to the Fed, um, who's looking to um Uh, further depress uh, inflation going forward. Now, Ellen, one more final elephant in the room for this economy. Maybe it's not an elephant. I don't know. Maybe it's a baby elephant or uh, something smaller. I don't know. A, a donkey or something, but the United, United Auto Workers strike. Um, and I'm not sure if your team have, have done any work on this, but it, it's again, one of those things where I think there's a little bit of a risk to inflation and a little bit of a risk to growth. You know, obviously, however, this is resolved, it's going to be a significant wage increase for a very influential union that may inspire other u- unions other workers, more other labor groups to seek higher wages. Also could cause the price of cars to go up again. Uh, That was a pretty uh, big part of the the CPI numbers for certain months, used cars. Um, And obviously, if there's a lot of lost production, there's going to be a drag on growth. But how big of a deal is it if it lingers on, if the strike expands to other plants? You know, is it a, a, a risk to the headline numbers in either CPI and GDP, or is it, does it not rise to that level? Yeah, I think that, that you know, autos are a major sector in the U.S., and right now the strike has started off small. Um, it's not impacting a, a good deal of, of, of workers, right? So it's not been as big of a drag as we initially expected on, say, impl- the employment report. Um, but let's say it extends for some time more and broadens out to capture more workers. So first and foremost, if it extends through mid-October and starts to capture the survey week in which we survey employers for their level of payrolls, well, then you could get something like a negative payroll print in the month of October, which would be reported in, in early November. So again, go back to the additional fog this creates on the data front for for the Fed. In terms of GDP, you know, it's interesting. There, there seemed to be some evidence that automakers were ramping up production ahead of the planned strike. But it does interrupt production for the time being during the stri- strike, and then that resumes. So you would have further weight on fourth quarter uh, industrial production and GDP um, if the strike goes on for a while. Average hourly earnings is is interesting because it's not just the fact that you know if you count the UAW strike alone it's not that big of an aggregate wage bill to really move the needle na- nationwide but as you say what if there are spillovers what if other unions take the example of UPS and UAW and start to follow suit um you start to get a notable impact if say you're pulling in uh, the majority of all union workers in the U.S. So it does take a significant wave, uh, capturing almost all union workers to really show up on on average hourly earnings in a meaningful way. Um, but I think that I would just take it at the, the, the at its least. Um, it adds to all of that data fog we've been talking about that it will make it very difficult for the Fed um, to hike rates further this year. Ellen, I have a million more questions for you, so I'll just uh, I'm going to combine two of them <laughs> very quickly because I think this is important to bring up. One is about your 
track record, which you've been spot on about the soft landing narrative. I think you've been calling for a soft landing for quite a while. So I wanted to ask you about that. But I also want to ask you about, I don't know if ironic is the the right word or what word we can use, but is it around ironic that recession odds have gone up just as people have priced out a recession? Yes, I think um, those are great questions, and it gives me a chance to pat myself on the back, which economists (laughs) have a rare opportunity to do. Um, And we have been calling for a soft landing since February of last year, Um, and we could do a whole other podcast on just why that is. But, you know, I think what I would like to impart is that even as I've had that long soft landing narrative and others have finally grabbed onto that. I have not reduced my recession probability. First of all, let me just say, any economist that says they're accurate more than two quarters out is just lying. Um, You can get the narrative right. You almost always get the numbers wrong. Uh, and um, And so with that being said, I'm very confident that we have enough momentum in the economy to get us through the next six months. And so I think for the next six months, the odds of recession should be lower. I think when you go out a full 12 months, which when we talk about recession probabilities, it's always over a 12-month horizon. The six months beyond that, I am not so certain about. Uh, I think there's been so much monetary policy tightening that I do believe has not all come through. I think a lot can go wrong with the economy the further you go out on the horizon. And so I have not reduced my recession probability that within the next 12 months, there's a 40% chance we do have a downturn. I'm confident it will be mild, but I do think um, that we have to be realistic and not reduce the probability of recession too much just because today growth remains very resilient. Well, Alan Zentner, Chief U.S. Economist at Morgan Stanley, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and and sharing your thoughts. Uh, A lot to think about. Can't let you go quite yet, though. However, uh, we do have attrition on the show where we must share the craziest things we saw in markets this week. I'm going to go first. Mine's a little stale. It's almost two weeks old. So forgive me, Vildana. All right. uh, Wall Street Journal story about California real estate, uh, particularly the Brady Bunch house. Did you watch the Brady Bunch as a kid, Vildana? I did not. You know, she might be a little bit younger than us. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, we're, I'm dating dating myself here, Ellen, to some degree. But uh, famous house, you see the picture of it at the beginning of every show and every commercial break. It recently went on sale. Uh, and so it's time to play the prices precise. And you guys have to guess what the sale price was for the Brady Bunch house. I'll give you a little more details. It was previously bought by H, uh, HGTV. And they did a whole show about remodeling the inside of it to make it look like the house on the show, um, which I'm not sure boosted its value because it's all dated 70s appliances and furniture. And I'm not sure that's what your average L.A. house hunter is looking for. But it did sell. uh, So the question is, what do you think the Brady Bunch house just sold for? So it's in it's in L.A. It's in Los Angeles. How many rooms? It's huge, actually. Five bedrooms, total square footage, approximately 5,000 wow. feet. Wow. Um, with, they added bedrooms and a second floor when they did this whole remodel to, I guess, recreate the, the kids' rooms and everything. So five bedroom, 5,000 square foot house in LA, not cheap. They don't tell you, the story doesn't tell you what neighborhood in LA, which might- Oh, that was going to be my next question. Okay, I'm going to go with $3.5 million. $3.5 million. Uh, Ellen, what's your bid for the Brady Bunch house? Completely remodeled t- to match interior and ex- Can I price this right, Vidana? Absolutely. <laughs> and, and say three, three and a half and one dollar. No, I'll say, I don't know. If I think about the square footage, the cost per square footage um, in LA, even though we don't know the neighborhood, I think I would say closer to $9 million. Wow. I would have guessed somewhere in that vicinity. I'll be honest. A 5,000 square foot house in LA, five bedrooms. But as the buyer points out, it actually sold for less than what HDTV bought it for because 
the buyer thinks no one wants to live in a house with these 70s appliances and shag carpet. And uh, so $3.2 million. Oh, so my over. gosh. Wow. wow we, we all over guessed. Even if you told me a 5,000 square foot house in L.A. with five bedrooms, I would have gone over 3.2. So I mean, buy it and gut it. <laughs> Although that might not be allowed. Now, if there's historical landmark designation on it, as you know, that's going to reduce the value. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. I don't know if a a recreation of the historical interior counts, but maybe. I don't know. That's all I got. I have a good one. It's also a Wall Street Journal story. The headline is, a mother's love, a bargain at $450 a year plus applicable fees. It's about parents hiring concierge services for their college students. So you send your you send your kid off to college, then you hire somebody to be their mom. The mom can hug, bring you soup when you're sick, uh, pick up your medicines. Uh, furniture assembly is one of the things for some reason. They give you they give students rides to and from the airport. It's just Wait, furniture assembly. I know. The, they go to doctor's appointments with people. It's just, yeah, four hundred fifty a year. Can I hire? Year. Can I hire one of these for myself? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Look, furniture assembly is a stressor. <laughs> yes, you know, it is. It really is. It's a real stressor. <laughs> that alone is worth the four hundred and fifty bucks. That's pretty good. Don't let my daughter at the University of Maryland find out about this. We, I've, I've got enough expenses related to her <laughs> education. I don't. I don't. I don't need any more. Uh, that's pretty good. How about you, Ellen? Have you seen anything crazy lately? I'm going to still go back to, you know, sort of all the wrap up reports after the the Fed meeting um, where it just seemed, you know, why? Why does the market take the Fed at face value and suddenly all of a sudden decide that the Fed are perfect forecasters and know exactly what's going to happen even out to 2026? Why? <laughs> and so uh, that always astounds me. Yeah. Yeah. The dot plot was a blessing and a curse, I guess. I wonder, I sometimes wonder if they regret introducing that, that it maybe it causes more uh, confusion than it, than uh, clarity that they, they hope it would cause. Yeah. But. There are definitely those on the Fed that, that regret it. But, you know, once the Fed introduces something, it's near impossible to take it away. So, so Chair Powell, even with Chair Powell saying, basically, ignore the dot plot. It's just sort of a fun exercise for 19 participants to air their dirty laundry about what they think about the outlook. Um, nevertheless, markets take it at face value as though that is exactly the path that the Fed will follow. That's It's etched in stone, not in you know light-colored pencil that could be erased at the next meeting. All right. Ellen Zentner, Chief U.S. Economist at Morgan Stanley, thank you so much for joining us. You bet. Thank you, Ellen. What Goes Up will be back next week. Until then, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal website and app or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you took the time to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts so more listeners can find us. And you can find us on Twitter. Follow me at Reganonymous. Voldana Hyrick is at Voldana Hyrick. You can also follow Bloomberg Podcasts at Podcasts. What Goes Up is produced by Stacey Wong. Thanks for listening. See you next time.